All right. Anytime you're ready to do that, I'm going to do that with you. I'll do it. Oh, I'm going to reach out. Okay. Okay. As tomorrow being Memorial Day, of course, we want to pay, pay tribute to bring it back from the high on speakers. Okay. So we want to pay tribute to all of our veterans as well as in memory of all of those who gave their lives in service to that country. And that's what Memorial Day is all about. And uh, I know a few years back we, we did a Memorial Day service and and we didn't have taps for that. So I rolled up here that afternoon in my pickup and I had taps on a CD. I drove over here on the hill and I was the only one here, and I opened the doors of my truck, and I played the tap for all those people up there who served, and many of those who gave the ultimate price. So Buster's gonna play the taps to honor all of them. Guys, who paid the ultimate price, and all of us, if you have served, blow your horn, so we know who's, yeah. You've been in the military, blow your horn. Okay, we honor you as well. So Buster, do that for us. special um our choir special i know many of you are members of our choir well, you're going to hear yourself saying this morning is jim you got that ready back there go ahead with the choir special
You did a good job. And you can hear yourself sing again. Today, I realize we've come to worship the Lord, but in the process of this, there's something that the Lord has laid on my heart, and I want to share with you along that way. Uh, I think it's a real problem for many of us during the session we're in with the virus and all. Amber Bonbeck, and some of you may have read her book entitled, If Your Life is a Bowl of Ro Cherries, Why Am I Always in the Pits? Um, doesn't that express what a lot of us feel at times in life? Maybe it expresses what you feel right now. You just feel down in the pits. Well, join me. Uh, we have that feeling sometimes as well. But, you know, being down in the pits is a time when, when even in that time, life may seem wonderful and you may have everything you ask for and expect to have, and all of a sudden there's a feeling of despair and hopelessness. The valley you're in seems to be getting deeper, and you just can't seem to get out of the pits. The result, basically, is depression is beginning to set in. Now, the National Institute of Health reports that depression is the number one psychological or mental problem today. And many of the doctors today are saying many of us in our society now are going through that very thing, whether we acknowledge it or realize it or not. So this morning, I want to think for a little while about last Sunday we dealt with defeating the Goliaths of life. I think depression is one of those Goliaths that we have to deal with sometimes in life. Just a few months ago, you asked me to come back and serve as your pastor for a few months, and I agreed to do that. But before we even got our feet off the ground, the virus came along. The church was shut down. According, according to the governor's restrictions, I was to stay home as well as you. We couldn't get together to worship the Lord. I couldn't visit in the hospital. I couldn't visit those in the nursing home. I couldn't visit anyone, really, because I was told to stay home. Not only by the Lord, I mean by the governor, but by my, my daughters made a pretty good job at that as well. I won't tell you the, the philosophy and the statements that was used. But my role as your pastor was basically shut down. Everything a pastor is expected to do was put on hold. And I realized, I, I sort of put it off for a while, but I realized that I was going through a time of depression. You see, preachers are human, just like you are human. And we have to deal with the same kind of problems you deal with, including those times of discouragement, despair, and depression. There are a number of explanations given for depression. The daily news is enough <laughs> to cause you to have that exp experience. And on top of that, you, you hear all that's going on with the virus and many other problems in the world. And when you hear all the problems that, that we're confronted with and that threatens us, it isn't unusual to develop a feeling of despair and depression. So, what are some symptoms of depression? So let's begin by looking at the symptoms. I can identify with most all of these, and I'm sure most of you probably can at some point in time as well. One of those symptoms is the feeling of gloom, despair, and hopelessness. It's the feeling that things will never work out. It's the feeling that uh, there is no light at the end of the tunnel. Uh, that what the valley you're going through is going to get deeper and deeper and deeper. That the burden you're bearing is going to get heavier and heavier. And the problem you're confronted with is only going to get worse, not better. And thus your life is shattered by feeling of gloom and despair and depression sets in. You see, when one gets into that depressed attitude, everything seems wrong. Everything in Washington is wrong. 
Everything in Richmond is wrong. Everything in Richmond County is wrong. Everything at Welcome Grove Church is wrong. Go right down the line. Everything at school is wrong. Everything at work is wrong. Right down the line, the depressed attitude is nothing is right and everything is wrong. And the attitude is rooted in the state of depression. Another symptom of, of, of depression is fatigue and apathy. You have that burnt out feeling. You feel like your get up and go has got up and gone. Uh, you, you have no enthusiasm and no excitement and you can't seem to get motivated and you just want to sit around and do nothing. And this burnout feeling and this not wanting to face life attitude is rooted in depression. Another symptom of depression is self-pity. That feeling that nobody loves me. Nobody appreciates what I do. Nobody knows what I'm going through. Nobody cares about me. In that state, it's not unusual for one to just wallow in self-pity. But keep in mind, self-pity pity is rooted in depression. Another symptom of depression is hair-triggered emotion. At the wink of an eye, or the drop of your hat, you go all to pieces and break down crying. Anybody been there recently? And the other side of that, and I can identify with this one, you blow up and get angry at the least little thing. Why are you talking to me like that? Why are you raising your voice? Well, they say this is that hair triggered emotions is, is rooted in depression. Now, I've mentioned some of the symptoms of depression, and I know there are many more. And I have to admit that I have or have had those times when I experienced all of these emotions. Some of them have been very recent. In fact, all of us have more than likely had some of them at times. And during those times, we may wonder, what's wrong with me? Why am I acting like this? Why am I talking like, why am I feeling like this? And whether we realize it or not, it or not the answer is, is a sign of depression. Now, depression is not something new, by the way. There's a record of some of the greatest characters in the Bible going through a time of depression. David. A man who is described as a man after God's own heart had times when he was down in the pits very deeply. Jeremiah was called the weeping prophet because he wrote about many things and he spent so many times clouded and burdened with a state of depression. The text we're referring to this morning is 1 Kings 18 and 19. Uh, and there we find Elijah, the prophet of God. Now, Elijah really got down to the pits with the feeling of depression. His story here in the scripture is a perfect example of the cause as well as the cure for depression. You see, depression is, has its psychological dimensions, but it also has its spiritual dimensions. And so we need to deal with it from both sides, psychologically and spiritually. Even doctors tell us today that you cannot separate the physical from the spiritual. And this is true in the matter of depression. In 1 Kings 19, 1 and 10, we're told about Ahab the king who married a woman named Jezebel. <laughs> I, I listened to five sermons this morning already, and Tony Evans preached on this very thing, 1 Kings 18 and 19. <laughs> And I'll never get one comment. He said, the last positive comment Ahab ever had was when he said, I do. From that point on, he said, Jezebel was in control. <laughs> and so, you know, the king and his wife both worshiped the false gods of Baal, as well as the false gods of the Canaanites. And thus, this couple began to promote the false prophets of Baal, and began to lead the nation, Israel, away from the worship of Almighty God. 
One day, as we read this text, we find Elijah walked into the king's office and said, basically, king, God's judgment is coming upon you. Your queen and your kingdom, thou shalt not be one drop of rain or dew upon your region until you repent. Well, the king did not repent. And a great drought came upon the land. King Ahab had a national crisis on his hand. There was no rain for three years. The people of the land were becoming restless and rebellious. Is that not similar to the state of the people of our state and our nation today? They're becoming restless and rebellious. So the king in desperation called for Elijah. He wanted to know, Elijah, what can be done to bring the drought to an end? And Elijah said, well, here's what we can do. <coughs> Let's gather together all the people, as well as the 450 prophets of Baal, and let's gather at Mount Carmel. And when they all had gathered there, Elijah engaged the prophets of Baal in a contest to prove who was the true and living God. The false gods of Baal are almighty God. And so Elijah said to all present, as we do, go through this trial of testing whose God is real, we encourage you folks, If how long will you falter between two opinions? If the Lord God is God, worship him. And if Baal is God, worship him. And so the prophets of Baal, as well as Elijah, were prepared to do that. They prepared an altar. And then they placed a young bullock on the lost altar sacrifice. And they were called, the prophets of Baal, had their first test to call upon their God to come and send down fire from heaven, from above to consume the sacrifice on the altar. Well, the prophets of Baal got there and they began to call on Baal to, you know, send down, send down fire, send down fire, send down fire. But you know something? Fire never came. And then the scripture tells us it was Elijah's time. So Elijah had the altar prepared as well. He he put the bullock on the altar as a sacrifice. And then he did something unusual. He called for his guys to help him. Dig a trench around the altar and fill that trench with water. And let's see what God, almighty God, is going to do. And so Elijah prayed. He called upon God to send down the fire from heaven. And you know what? He said, Lord God. Let it be known this day that you are the God of Israel. Hear me, that this people may know that you are the Lord God. Like a bolt of lightning, fire came down from heaven and consumed the sacrifice. The altar licked up the water in the trenches. When all the people saw it, they said, the Lord, he is God. <clears throat> it was a mighty demonstration of the presence and power of Almighty God. So as a result of all that happened, the people turned against the prophets of Baal and they were all put to death. When Jezebel heard all that Elijah had done, she was fierce. So she sent Elijah a message and here's what it said. May God strike me dead if I have not done to you by this time tomorrow the same thing you've done to my prophet. In other words, Jezebel was saying, by this time tomorrow, Elijah, I'm going to have you dead. So from a mountaintop experience, <coughs> excuse me, with God, an experience of victory, Elijah takes off running for his life because of Jezebel's threat. He ends up in the Sinai wilderness. He finally falls exhausted under a juniper tree. He had a feeling of despair and distress come upon him. In his mind, he searched for ways he could escape the death threat of Jezebel. Then the thought came to his mind that death would be better than what he was now going through. So here's what he did. He prayed. And here's what he said, Lord, it's enough. 
take my life from me. In other words, Elijah was praying, God, let me die right here, right now. Many times <laughs> in a time of depression, we may say things we don't really mean. That reminds me of the story I read about a construction worker. He was a guy who carried bricks to the brick masons. It was a hot July day. The bricks were heavy. The building was tall, and the work was very hard, and the worker became very exhausted and discouraged, and he said, I wish I was dead. But at that time, the brick mason on the second floor happened to drop a brick. He hit the worker very squarely on his head. And he, be, he, he immediately tried to show that he didn't mean what he was saying because he said, Lord, don't take me seriously. Beloved, Elijah didn't mean what he said. He didn't really want to die. He didn't need to be running from death because Jezebel was right there ready to end it for him if he would stand still long enough. And he was down in the pits. Elijah is a basic example of one in a state of depression. So those are the symptoms. Now let's look at the root cause of depression. What caused Elijah's depression? I think, you know, we can basically identify with these. Elijah had lost his physical stamina. He was physically and mentally tired and worn out. He had run many miles running away from the death threat. He was physically exhausted. No wonder he was down in the pits. This is what happens to us when we have great stress and great pressure, when we have more work than we could possibly get on top of, and when everything seems to be piling up, until we become physically exhausted and at last we end up greatly depressed. The second thing that caused Elijah's problems was Elijah took his eyes off God. Just a few days earlier at Mount Carmel, he had his mind and his heart fixed on God. His faith in God was real. He had seen God work in, in a very glorious and powerful way. He had a mountaintop experience with God, but now we see him down in the pits wishing he was dead. Why? He had focused on the problem with Jezebel and had taken his eyes off God. That's what happens to us at times. We look at our problems that confront us. We begin to focus on what we're dealing with or what we're going through. And we take our eyes off the one who is promised. I will never leave you or forsake you. I will be with you always, even to the very end of the world. So, beloved, when you focus your attention on those problems of life and let them preoccupy your mind every moment, every day, and you take your eyes off God, you will end up in a state of depression. The third thing, and I think this, we can identify with this very closely because of what we're going through, Elijah had lost his contact with those he loved. He made the same mistake many of us make in times of despair. He withdrew himself. That's one of the biggest mistakes we can make. During this virus, we may not have wanted to, but we were forced to withdraw ourselves from society. We were to stay home. So we lost contact with most of those we love and care about our loved ones, our family, our friends. Beloved, everybody needs somebody they can share their problems with. Everybody needs somebody on whose shoulder they can cry. Everybody needs somebody to whom they can say, I'm down in the pits, I'm discouraged, I'm distressed. Will you help me? Elijah was down in the pits and he was as far as away from his friends and loved ones as he could get and that's one reason why he was depressed. Doesn't all that sound like today? Many who are, are unable to work because of the shutdown have lost their physical stamina. 
On top of that, we read the papers and hear the news, and we focus on the virus problems, and we take our eyes off of God. And then because of the stay-home restrictions, we have lost or have limited contact with our family and friends. It's no wonder, my friends, why many of us, including this preacher, are not experiencing times of depression. So what's the cure? Well, the first thing that happened was God caused Elijah to fall asleep. God gave him some food in the time of rest. You can't beat that with helping with depression. Some food and rest. Some sleep. And then God sent an angel to minister to him and strengthen him. And God made Elijah aware that the key to defeating this giant was getting his physical being all straightened out. Second thing that God did God showed him his error. Elijah had failed to believe that the God who had sent fire down from heaven on Mount Carmel was now able to give him the victory over the death threats of Jezebel. Out there in the desert, he was made aware that God was bigger than any problem he had. And this is also true of us today. God is bigger than the virus or any other problem we may have. So we need to trust him. We need to depend on him. We need to just allow him to work in and through our lives to accomplish his will in his way. But I like number three. God put Elijah back to work. He was telling Elijah, stop wallowing in your self-pity. There is much work to be done. Go back and find a man named Elisha. Teach him, train him, that he may carry on your ministry once you are no longer here. Don't you see what God was doing? He sent Elijah out to do something for somebody else. And that made it possible for him to take his mind off himself and his problem. During this virus time, I know staying at home with your family and friends, your husband or your wife, you know, you need to find ways to communicate and ways to get along at that closeness for a long time. And during this time, Marion and I started making face masks. We made it. We made 200 face masks. We donated them to the hospital, doctor's office, individuals. But during that time, we had a purpose. We had something to do that kept us busy, that stopped us from dwelling on the problems of the virus. We made something for someone else. You know, I think that's why so many people today want to go back to work. They want to have a purpose in life. And beloved, when people find themselves doing something that's worthwhile, when, when they're doing something that's providing for their family, when they're doing something, uh, pouring their lives out in, in, to meet the needs of others, or, or giving their life in service to God, they have a sense of purpose in life. A sense of fulfillment and a sense of work was established by God. So we're doing what God has told us to do. We're working. We have a purpose again. And I think that's what a lot of our people in our country are seeking today. A purpose in life. Rather than staying home and do nothing. So yes, God, God pulled Elijah out of his state of depression by getting him back to work getting involved in active service to others and to God. Reminds me of the story of a guy named Raw Regal, who was a football player. And he took the ball and ran the wrong way for a touchdown for the opposing team at the Rose Bowl for Southern California. He later, he told the story of what his coach said to him at halftime. And here's what he said. The coach put his hands on my shoulder and said, son, the game is just half over. Get back in the game. And I think that's what God wants us to do. I think that's what the people of our country need to do. We need to get back in the game. We need to, we need to fulfill our purpose in life. And that's what God is saying to us when we're down in the pits. He's saying, 
if you want to get out of the pits, if you want to end that time of depression, if you want to defeat that giant that confronts you, get up and get back out there. Get involved. Get back in the game. Just remember one thing. Great is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Believe that you have a purpose in your life and that God plan, has a plan for your life and he has great blessing in store for you. Just get back in the game. You know, if you're down in the pits today, if you feel distressed and or working on the rages of your emotion, God doesn't want you to stay there. God wants you to get out of it. He wants to give you the victory over the giant you now face. He wants to reach out to you that you may reach out to other people. He wants to, to reach out in service to others and to the Lord Jesus. He wants you to, again, realize you have a purpose in life. And that purpose basically for us as Christians is to honor and glorify the living God. And we got to do that to the best of our ability. And we need to get back out in the game. He wants you to take your eyes off your problem and focus on the one who can help you conquer those problems. He wants you to know as we sing the song, there is victory in Jesus and he will help us through in the valley we walk through any time of discouragement we deal with just remember he said I will always be with you depend upon the Lord to help you walk through that valley just remember you're not walking through it alone he has his hand and his arms wrapped around you. And he wants you to understand, I'm here with you in the midst of all this. And we're going to walk on through this to the mountaintop on the other side. Father, we realize there are lessons in life that we need to learn. And sometimes those lessons don't come easy. Sometimes we can read about the ways we can do things that will help us experience victory over some kind of giant that has confronted us. But help us to understand we can't conquer that giant alone. We need your help, Lord. We need your encouragement. We need you to help us overcome those byproducts of the virus and give us the victory of walking with you the valleys of life. And we praise you in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Jim, can you give us some more music back there? Um, Charles, Joe, where are you? Okay, you got the net? Uh, we'll take an offering as well, just like we do in morning worship time. So in order to help you not have to mail them, which many of you have done and are doing, We'll just take them here this morning and save you, what is it, 55 cents, I guess, to get it in the mail. Okay, but Charles will, will bring, the, we, we're doing it with a net because that way he can stick, just stick it through the window. Um, we're going to do it one way, you know, we're not going to stick it back in the window the second time. <laughs> it's just be a one-time occurrence, okay? So, Jim, you can give us some music so we can play that during the time of the offering. By the way, okay, I'm off again. Okay. We got it, Jim. <laughs>